Make small talk. We're recording. Commissioners. Is that now? Okay. Actually, give me a, if we actually want the phones off. Let me. Yeah. I got three of them. Oh jeez. So let me literally go through. Sorry. What's the third one? Yeah. Um, personal work. Gambling is the third. Yeah, game. yeah. Gambling and uh, sports betting. Campaign. Oh right. Of course. Right. I want a separate phone for sports betting. They don't make you carry around a satellite phone. Uh, actually, the, it's at home in my <laughs> in my closet for uh, Armageddon. It's in. all right. Are we rolling? Okay. Thank you for joining us today. We're here for our endorsement interview for uh, Measure Twenty Six Dash Two Four Five, Portland's local gas tax. If you would like to introduce yourselves and say a little bit about why you support it, that'd be great. We have people here for the yes campaign. We don't have anybody here for a no position. There's no so, way in that position. Why don't um, we start with Ryan and Lyon circling It's going to be, uh, uh, sure. Yeah. We'll start on, you want to, are we starting online? Did you say? Let's start with, we'll just oh. do a quick intro of Ryan and then myself. Okay, okay. I, I see. Do it. Hey Ryan. Take it away. Hey. And then I have tried to sign into the video link. No worries if that doesn't work. I'm fine using the phone. Um, I just heard someone ask if I could log in to the video. It's um, not really necessary, Ryan. Right? To be to be let in. So. No worries. That's okay. The audio is fine. Just okay. Cool. And then I will click off of this. Thing. Thank you. And then just go ahead and introduce yourself, Ryan. And my name is Ryan Sofmayor. I'm the business manager and secretary treasurer of Labor's Local 483. Um, I'm on unpaid leave from the city. I came to work for the city in 2016 and parts and recreation, and then I came to work for the union in 2022 full time. Great. And I'm Amy Ruiz with Swift Public Affairs. We are the campaign consultants for the measure. And my name's Megas Maps. I'm one of your commissioners on Portland City Council. And uh, importantly for today, I am the commissioner in charge of PBOT. And the item before us is uh, critical for uh, our city's ability to maintain and upkeep our uh, roads, sidewalks, and bikeways. Excellent. Who'd like to make the uh, sort of initial case for this? Here, why don't I? Um, you know, I, um, I've been on council for about three and a half years. I've had the transportation portfolio for a little bit more than a year at this point. I'll tell you, um, in my time in public life, and in particular on council, one of the things I've learned is the vital importance of infrastructure in our city, and in particular, our transportation and mobility infrastructure. Uh, PBOT, the, the funds that are brought in by fixing our streets are used for basic maintenance. We're talking about paving our roads, uh, safety improvements, uh, um, basic maintenance. Um, I think we have a really good package that we put it before voters. It's going back all the way to 2016. Every four years, we bring this package before voters and ask them to either renew it or not. Um, these dollars, which over the course of four years represent about $70 million, uh, that again we spend on paving, safety improvements, and basically fixing the things that are broke. Uh, um, should these dollars go away, um, that represents about a third of the discretionary dollars that we have over at PBOT for that kind of basic maintenance work. You know, PBOT's total budget is about 500 million. A lot of those are those dollars are actually cap, capital improvement uh, projects that are basically funded in partnership with large grants that we get from the feds or state. Uh, this pot of money, uh, the discretionary pot of money, um, is what we use to maintain the system we have. This represents about a third of it. Uh, should this not get approved, um, that knocks a huge hole um, in our ability to serve the people of Portland and keep our road systems going. And any Portlander who's gone out on a bicycle or walked or gotten in a car knows that our roads are trashed. Um, they were in a bad position before, and I'll tell you that ice storm that we had a couple of months ago clearly did a number on us. We will be in a very, very, very difficult situation uh, should this not get renewed. On the other hand, can you 
describe why the ice storm is a big deal? Just the mechanics of the, what it does to the asphalt, it's simple, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, water gets in there, expands, it kind of breaks it apart. I think, frankly, we were probably more aggressive around uh, snowing and plowing than we have been in the past. Hmm. So I think some of those potholes you see, I, I can literally tell. Uh, probably some of our equipment kind of bumped uh, uh, against the bottom of it. So that's where some of the, even in a matter of weeks, giant potholes in places that I hadn't seen them before suddenly emerged. Um, you know, climate change is this really interesting uh, space where you think of the, the world getting warmer, but actually, obviously, one of the things we see in Portland is we get more of the extremes. We get the 119 days, and then we have um, ice storms in a way that um, I wasn't seeing when I was a kid in Portland in the 70s and 80s. And that does a number on our roads and our sidewalks. Clearly, you, you know, we're getting to the point where uh, we have lots of buildings that have their pipes broken too. So all of our infrastructure is under strain as the world around us changes. Uh, frankly, the dollars that we use to adjust to that largely come from this space. Um, so we're, we're in alignment on the larger climate change issue. I still don't understand how the ice storm causes causes sinkholes. Sinkholes. Well, sinkholes. I haven't. We haven't. Sinkholes definitely happen in Portland. That's a, a regular thing that or we're talking. Or any holes. Like don't. Like, oh, right. I still don't understand how it is that the ice storm caused potholes or sink or sinkholes or any holes. Oh, you have. I think you have uh, water that melts and freezes and remelts and whatnot. So it just kind of gets in between the cracks. Yeah, water gets in and, and expands. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's the and it just kind of slowly just breaks it uh, um, breaks it apart it's uh, it's a real number um, I, and I frankly I s literally see it you know in front of my house and in, in my backyard it's ice is just a really challenging uh, element to, to try to battle yeah so, water's so one of the only elements that gets bigger when it yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. It gets colder right yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's what's doing it yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's uh, this is a problem which is I've spent a fair bit of time and uh, in the Northeast you see a lot of uh, these issues back there um, and it's one of the things that we need to come to terms with it's also one of the it's also the case that frankly if you don't maintain your infrastructure um, over time it tends to get worse one of the challenges we've had in Piedmont uh, actually going back many years now is because um, you know frankly our cars are getting more energy efficient that's great but also that brings in fewer gas taxes as gas taxes have gone down, um, our revenues from gas taxes have gone down, um, our ability to keep up with basic maintenance um, has deteriorated, um, and so we're kind of caught in a vicious cycle now. And that explains what you see out on the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. So 20% uh, of the new cars sold in the metro region are electric now? I believe that's the best that's a correct. Lot of, a lot of the cars are also part hybrid, like Anthony just bought one that's, you know, 40 miles on the charge and then it goes to gas. So how are you going to, how come you're not, or how are you going to capture revenue from electric cars, which are just, are heavy? Mm -hmm. do as much yeah. damage as oh absolutely cars. you know number one thank you for uh, driving a hybrid car uh, number two one of the other realities of our new electric vehicles we want to electrify our transportation uh, uh, fleet is the fact that they are much heavier yeah. than our, our regular cars so that's also one of the things that's kind of uh, working against us too um, and this I think this is true you can you can kind of look into the future you can see that the days of the gas powered uh, vehicle is numbered you know um, I certainly think I might even live long enough to see the last uh, new gas car um, being sold. Um, so the the the, um, the gas tax, which is the main, main net mechanism that we use to fund our transportation network, um, is clearly obsolete. So we're in dialogue with the state legislature, and we are dial in dialogue with our partners um, in Washington to figure out what happens next. Um, I'll tell you. Um, I don't have the power as a as a member of Portland City Council to uh, impose a vehicle miles travel tax or something like that. You can imagine all the infrastructure that has to happen there. People will probably need to have transponders in their cars, and you'll have to have readers in the uh, in the infrastructure, which means you have to have the federal government at the table. You need to have the state government at the table. Um, Oregon is actually doing better than I 98% of the states, uh, or not, yeah, well, I think 48. I 
if you take a look at how far that we've come in terms of developing alternatives, I think Oregon and maybe Minnesota have gone the furthest in developing an alternative. And the alternative probably looks like a vehicle miles travel tax. Yeah, but, yeah, I mean, in your own numbers, you say this is going to cost the average driver $60 a year, $5. Something like that. So yeah. why not just say everybody... 10 cents plus everybody who's got an electric car plays 60 bucks a year. Well, um this is a conversation that we might have with which eventually we will have frankly one of the things that will happen in the next legislative session is i think that that is going to be largely focused in on transportation and figuring out you know how we go about funding our transportation system or at least our road network uh that's a promise we've heard out of the governor's office uh, so i think you know the next legislative session is going to be the big moment where we begin to figure out what we can do here i'll also tell you uh, this commissioner sorry to interrupt. Yeah. this is a peabody measure you could you could charge that right now why, why didn't you include some way of collecting since we're so short of revenue you're leaving all this revenue on the table with electric cars why, why are you doing that well i'll tell you one of the sort of realities of this moment in time is that uh, oregonians and portlanders in particular are um uh, economically burdened. Uh, their patience for new taxes is relatively low. I tell you, I did a little bit of polling before we went out um, and, uh, and decided whether or not we wanted to bring this thing forward. One of the things I discovered is if we increase the rate beyond uh, where it has been since 2016, support for this dropped off dramatically. So uh, um, I think my best bet in order to maintain the system we have is to uh, go forward, go to the borders and say, hey, can we maintain uh, the, the uh, local gas tax that we've had since 2016 at the same rate given inflation? This is actually a reduction in the tax. Um, mm -hmm. It's also consistent with some of the priorities I've heard the governor voice and frankly the mayor voice where we're trying to keep um, our local taxes uh, essentially flat for the next couple of years while we try to recover economically. Um, I'll tell you, does this, uh, even renewing this, does this solve Peabot's uh, economic problems? No. You know, structurally, I head into this next fiscal year, and this is what we're doing in City Hall right now, with a $35 million structural hole in Peabot. Mm -hmm. um, we have lots of strategies for shrinking that to a much smaller space uh, but even then um, even to maintain the status quo uh, given the dollars we have um, it's not nearly enough uh, should this go away that's going to be incredibly problematic and when I talk to voters about hey how do you feel about a new tax for X Y or Z they look at me very skeptically and I understand that too so so I'm just gonna try one more time yeah you're telling me you don't have enough money Peabody is broke Yep. So you're going to give everybody who drives a Tesla a break. I drive a 12-year-old gas guzzler, I'm paying the tax. My neighbor who drives a Tesla, he's not paying anything. How's that fair? Well, How does that address the structural financial problem of your own heads? One of the things I am asking the, the legislature to do, and literally the Secretary of Transportation and his staff to do, is to help us develop a vision for something beyond the gas tax. And we're not there yet. We haven't reached a consensus. Yeah, I say 60 bucks a year, Tesla tax, 60 bucks a year. I, I just feel like you're coming in here and telling us we don't have any money and we're not going to tax Teslas, and I think that's, no, that's lazy. Well, um, I, trust me, we're working very hard to make the system that we have work, and we're also working very hard to actually uh, minimize the uh, new cost burdens on um, Oregonians. Um, I do also will tell you um, the gas tax is a um, is obsolete. Um, the gas tax will not be the major tool that we use to fund our transportation system uh, two decades from now, and I doubt it will be the system that we use to predominantly uh, fund our transportation system even 10 years from now but I do think that in order to move into this new new direction uh, great great issues around uh, whether or not we uh, uh, how we get uh, electric vehicles to participate in funding our system too especially given the wear and tear they do on our roads uh, but right now uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is to make sure that we um, are able to survive frankly the next four years oh. And this is a four-year renewal, a ten-year renewal, four-year renewal, four-year renewal. How much is it going to raise in four years? Seventy point five. And, and will will it though? Because it sounds like nobody's actually paying. It. 
Oh, um, we expect so. You know, the last four, four years ago, the, the one that will expire, I think on July 1, raised $75 million. One of the ways in which you can see the uh, cars become more efficient is the fact that we expect this to raise 70, I think 70.5. Uh, so you can see that slope cutting in now. And certainly, um, you know, we we tried to price this out so it's uh, so it's on target. That's our best estimate as to where we're going. Um, could fuel efficiency increase so dramatically over the course of the next four years that we don't even get to 70? I guess that could happen. Although in this case, I will trust our engineers and economists who came up with these estimates. Do you know how, what other um, cities have get local gas taxes. I was looking for this, I couldn't find it. Oh gosh. Um, oh, there's one, uh, some of the coastal cities have them that are seasonal. Okay. Um, I know that offhand, uh, we can get, we can talk But are we, this. are we an outlier as a big American city that, uh, I'm, I'm talking about, you know. Oregon, so okay, kind of okay. I'll tell you something, uh, one of the alternative strategies that we put forward, uh, or not put forward, but explored, you folks probably remember this, uh, I bet you was probably about a year ago when it first came in, I saw this problem on the horizon, um, and we explored other alternative uh, tax systems, um, and frankly, this was the one after kind of reaching out to stakeholders, uh, stakeholders in the private sector, stakeholders in the transportation sector uh, and whatnot this is where the concept this is where the most consensus uh, lie. what was, was the other tax rate explored was it a water? yeah basically uh, you, the, the notion that okay what if everybody uh, if we considered um, transportation to be a utility which it basically is and uh, everyone paid five bucks a month or something uh, um, to maintain our, our transportation system. Uh, frankly, there are lots of towns in Oregon that have that. I went around and uh, talked uh, to various stakeholders and they told me in no unclear terms, hell no. Um, you know, you're not getting a new tax commissioner maps, um, and indeed, um, it is hardly a slam dunk that you're that um, uh, uh, um, this one will get renewed. Uh, um, people are so skeptical of government, and I understand why. Um, one of the things I have to make the case uh, today and uh, between now and election day is that you know this is a solid program that provides basic services that we desperately need. And frankly, if we do not renew this particular program, uh, we are going to be in a world of hurt. So quick question about like these different sections. One thing I'm always confused about at Peabody is like we have a number of projects that all sound very similar yep. and there's over lots of overlap yeah, yeah. and stuff. But like if so if if these amounts are going to each of these projects, are, are these projects or is this money gonna be expended in that same four years or could it take ten years for that? Oh, uh, you know, Peabot struggles to get things done a lot of the times. Yes, no, these dollars will get exp expended in real time or really close to real time. We have some projects uh, that we're probably paying for with the current fixing our streets. Back in your packet, a uh, status report on all the projects yeah, yeah, in the last yeah. four years. Uh, so the, this will get expended. There's not a whole lot of carryover on this. These are partly because of the nature of this project. So these are not, I'm not building a bridge here. I'm not digging a tunnel here. I'm filling potholes, I'm repaving roads. Um, I'm putting in, I'm replacing broken street lights, installing some, uh, some, um, some, some, you know, stop signals and what. How much of the money from the, the expiring gas tax has been? I don't have that off the top of my head, but I can you know to you. If it's not out, if it's not called out on that chart at the end, we can pull it up. And you know, I asked you a few just, projects like, oh, that are a lot of these things are things that have been in other Peabot projects that are, you know, they're eight years old and they're still not done. Oh, so sure. Well, they're also, you know, this represents some of the work that we do, but it doesn't represent all of the work that we do. I think I said this represents about a third of the uh, third of the discretionary dollars that we have. So we still have another two thirds, maybe $35 million in, in other basic maintenance work that we do. And sometimes, depending on the mix of money that's coming in for projects, it probably becomes a little bit complicated. I understand. So, so when it's a mixed pot of money from different funding sources, projects tend to take longer. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that. Um, you know, um, for some of our fixing our streets projects, we have uh, we have leveraged dollars and use them for matches. Uh, what I am saying, it's very different to uh, build, say, uh, highway caps. You know 
which is a very complicated thing, versus filling potholes, repaving, installing uh, crosswalks. Uh, these are pretty short. So I don't mean to belabor the issue, but like there's a crosswalk that was supposed to be installed at 97th and Woodstock seven years ago, and there's not even, there's no paint. I mean. And that's the same things that are saying, you know, that's the same set of things as signals and lighting maintenance. Right, right. And well, uh, this will not, uh, you know, I, let me be clear, um, the funds that we uh, draw on from fixing our streets to, is not, are not sufficient to meet every, um, to meet every safety need, every, to fill every pothole, but the absence of these funds will not help us fill a single pothole or to make one intersection safer. How did your March Madness pothole binge go? You it went great. On that? Um, I think we filled uh, 1,400 uh, potholes or so. So we, we did a, a really good job. Our teams worked uh, um, like a demon to get out there um, and tried to mitigate some of the um, effects that we saw from this winter. Um, we know that it's important to people. And, you Is know, that, now what, are those teams going to stay? What, what happens to those? Did you? You had like five, five and two or something. Are they going to stay on the scene now, or what was that? Oh yeah, I mean we have well we have teams that are out there um, filling potholes literally every day. Uh, we have a pothole uh, hotline if you call it. Our goal is to uh, fill those potholes within 30 days, and to a remarkable degree, we basically hit that mark. Uh, so you know if you report it, we will fill it. Um, is Wait, the so that's something possible. I don't understand. So if you report a pothole within 30 days, it'll get filled, but then unreported potholes because they're not on your guys' radar, it could be a year before they Oh, well, um, probably, we are certainly, we constantly study the um, state status of our roads. You know, if someone kind of brings a pothole to our attention that's particularly problematic, we try to get out there and be responsive. That's one of the principles that I brought to the Bureau. Um, but um, we don't have the, not every pothole gets reported. You know, I think a, a lot of Portlanders, no, no, number one, don't realize that they can report potholes. Um, um, so one of the things we need to do a better job is, uh, is public education in that space. But if you report a pothole, it'll probably get filled. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do. That's one of the things I've tried to do in this Have you space. seen our pothole hotline? Uh, your pothole hotline? Yeah, oh, you're, yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm ambivalent about it. I can't tell if you're helping my cause or, or embarrassing me, and a little bit of both. Sometimes uh, they go hand in hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, the fact that that um, captures the public imagination also underscores the fact that this is something which... Uh, Portlanders truly care about. Uh, one of the remarkable things about uh, being transportation commissioner is that it um, uh, it mobilizes uh, people. You know, um, lots of folks tend to think of infrastructure as being this boring space and whatnot. Um, on the other hand, I find it to be one of the most uh, passionate and um, and charged spaces in the city because number one, everyone interacts with the road, so you have a lived experience for how your sidewalk works, how your roads work, how scary it is to send your kid uh, to school on your bike. Um, so it, this is one of the fundamental services that the city provides that just really matters to Portlanders. If there was, if you talk about the climate effects on our roads and stuff, yeah. does that, in, I mean, you know, I'm just spitballing here, yeah. but, and it might be a little bit of a reach, but does that open this up to PSEF money somehow? Oh, and I will tell you, does, um, we could make that pitch, uh, and it's certainly uh, we probably made versions of that pitch. On the other hand, I will tell you, I started out with a thirty, probably a roughly thirty-five million dollars structural hole uh, in our budget going into next fiscal year. One of the things that um, one of the ways I'm filling that hole is we approached PSEF and said, "Hey." Um, we have lots of projects which intersect with um, the kinds of projects that you're trying to move forward. Uh, if you care about the environment, if you care about low-income communities, if you care about uh, marginalized communities, you should talk to people who um, who um, operate our streetcars. And so they've been, done a great job of helping us um, 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 uh, we're, we're, they've given us some dollars to replace some streetcars. They've given us some dollars to actually buy, uh, and this is great, um, energy efficient uh, stop 
stop stoplights and whatnot. Um, so, and they've given us some dollars to help maintain our bike infrastructure. So there is a great um, crossover there. Um, I haven't uh, pitched uh, the idea of helping uh, of approaching PCEF to help fill potholes. You know, I try to actually respect sure, the sure. parameters they put You around. do have that climate effect there. And, and to Nigel's point, you kind of have a, it's sort of a subsidy right now to people driving electric cars, which, I mean, you yeah. know. Uh, yeah, I, absolutely. Well, you know, a piece of, I, I think clearly the fact that uh, we, Peabot has been such a successful partner with PCEF is a sign that mm. we're having those dialogues. Uh, frankly, um, as the commissioner, uh, although I sit on city council, I um, do not allocate for the most part PCEF dollars. Mm. But one of the things I really have tried to do in my time here is to come, and, come to the table with PCEF in good faith and say, hey, you know, we have a lot of projects uh, that we're, do, we're doing right now. That are you have a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, and you know, you have a lot, you have a lot of vision too. Um, and uh, I, I will praise that group. They've, um, they've done, um, they've, they've been great partners there. In fact, I think my uh, team back in uh, my city hall office is literally meeting with the chairs of the PCEF committee right now to figure out what opportunities are. I think I expect PSAF to be around for a long time uh, and um, we're excited about the opportunity to partner with them to help uh, get these, uh, well, number one, help them get those dollars out in the street, you know, help uh, get keep carbon out of the air, uh, help BIPOC communities become more resilient as yeah. the world around us changes. Is Vision Zero part of this? I mean, is this part of the argument you guys are making for this gas tax or is that? Well, Vision Zero certainly, um, plays in here when you think about the safety projects here. So uh, we're basically gonna, if you think about this pulling in $70 million over three years, we're dividing it into three pots divided roughly equally. So paving is one category, fixing brick stuff is another category. And the, the middle category is safety. Certainly all the safety stuff uh, directly intersects with uh, I ask Vision because Zero. I, I feel like Vision Zero, everyone talked about it two, three years ago. No one talks about it anymore. And we're supposed to get to zero traffic deaths by next year? Um, that may explain why we're not talking about it, actually. I, I, well, I actually I push back on that premise. I hear about I, I hear about and talk about Vision Zero every day. So, and I think even if you come to council, literally, um, it is uh, now the norm that we have uh, at least one person on communications at every council meeting who talks about road safety. Uh, so, uh, this conversation has hardly gone away. However, I fully uh, recognize the reason why this conversation hasn't gone away is because traffic fatalities are um, horrific. We have not met our vision zero goals. Uh, I'm the commissioner in charge of transportation. I have an important role to help us get there. Infrastructure is a big part of the solution and the answer here, but there are other things that are up beyond my purview as the PBOT commissioner that are important uh, um, and matter in the traffic uh, fatality space. Uh, number one is enforcement. One of the yeah. things that has fought, happened uh, at this case uh, um, in recent years is uh, uh, traffic enforcement went away. That was a conscious choice made by council in retrospect, I think that was a mistake. Um, I will also tell you, and I think anyone who is, goes out there in the world, you see this driving behavior change dr during COVID. I am con one of the things I do every time I get behind a car is ask myself, um, how often do I see someone red run a red light? And I tell you, I cannot travel from uh, City Hall to my house at 20th and Stark without seeing at least one person run a red light and it's quite often it's three or four. I'm, I have seen four cars blast through a red light um, on uh, Burnside, you know, a set weekend morning, that's just the norm. Um, the another, you know, uh, so enforcement's a piece um, and, you know, behavior is also a piece that we need to uh, uh, um, talk about. I will tell you, um, we have stats that show, if we look at our traffic fatalities, um, a majority of our traffic fatalities involve one or both parties that are under the influence of drug or alcohol. And so, you know, so I'm trying to do public education. I'm nudging uh, my colleagues on council to, um, to support more traffic enforcement and I have to build better infrastructure. Um, and the safety part of our infrastructure is significantly supported by fixing our streets. We got $23.5 million over the next four years in this particular proposal specifically for making our roads safer.
Do you think there's any correlation between uh, changing over from uh, LEDs in street lamps from uh, bulbs that have a wider, um, you know, yeah, beam, yeah. because LEDs are narrow, bright yeah. but narrow. Yeah, yeah. And I have a friend who's, this is his theory. Okay. That these LEDs, brighter but narrower, are leaving darker streets and are causing more fatalities at night. Um, that's an interesting theory. You haven't heard it, or I, I haven't exactly heard it, and I will tell you um, that might be one in a string of variables. I will tell you the apps, the complete absence of street lights is probably a much that. larger variable. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, broken street lights are probably a bigger influence than sure. that. Sort of the quality of light of the of the you know the quality of lights of the modern light bulbs may be a variable too. But I'll tell you, I suspect it's an exceedingly small um, okay. amount. I frank, frank if um, I think the evidence shows that if people um, stop driving high um, and stop wandering around on the streets high, uh, I could cut uh, traffic fatalities in half. Uh, and that is a, a kind of a common sense thing. Um, I recognize uh, we're probably never going to achieve uh, perfect compliance in that space. But I will also tell you, I also think that over the past four years, we have not tried nearly hard enough to emphasize that just very important message um, right. and it's not just a nerd thing i tell you um if you hit someone in your car and kill them that will if you even if you survive that will change your life and your family's life forever and that happens you know um probably every third day here in portland it's really one of the um unrecognized tragedies um, mm. in our city and of this moment. And it's also one of the things that just makes this particular program so important. And one of the reasons why, um, you know, on my lunch hour and on my weekends and at night, I'm going out talking to labor and anyone else who will listen to me to talk about why it's important that we maintain this basic uh, funding source for basic street safety. Does, does the police bureau or PBOT keep numbers on what people are under the influence of when they're involved in uh, vehicular homicide? I believe that data does exist and it probably exists over in the counties shop, um, I think maybe the coroner or the medical advisor, um, whoever their medical person is in the space, um, maintains that data. I think they put, if I remember correctly, they do an annual report. I'll also tell you, um, about the people who are killing people yeah, 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 yeah. or just the dead people? Um, I think we have data on both. I mean, that's where our... I'm very interested in the people behind the wheel. Like, what yeah. are they on? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that, I think, an interesting question. So I'll tell you what, if you, uh, I can reach out to my office and uh, I believe that data does exist because I know we do have data on both the driver, we have the driver and the corpse, frankly. Um, and we get that data. I'd love to look at both of those. I realize they're not really germane to the question of whether we should renew the gas tax, but that's very, very interesting. Sure. Post. And I'll also tell you, speaking of how often we talk about Vision uh, Zero, I will be bringing my annual Vision Zero report to council um, later this month, I think the 24th, if that's a Wednesday. Um, and uh, one of the things that's going to be different about this report is, you know, you'll see PBOT there, but you'll also see the police bureau there and you'll see the fire bureau there. Uh, because I think one of the things that we realize is that traffic deaths, um, our uh, infrastructure plays a role here, but there's also, you know, there's infrastructure, there's enforcement, and then there's culture. Uh, and we have to and we have to address all three. What's the top line finding of the, this year's Vision Zero report? Uh, um, it's yeah, it's bad. Mm. It's bad. I haven't seen the fi the final draft, but uh, you know, you folks uh, write the paper every day, and I read it, and you know, uh, we uh, see dozens of traffic deaths here in Portland. We've gone um, the wrong direction. Um, and that's um, it's a tragedy, and I tell you, um, that tragedy is not going to get better if we pull $37 million out of, um, or $23 million out of our efforts to make our infrastructure safer. Um, lighter note? Yeah. Um, how can't, re how, maybe it's just me, I'm getting older, why can't you read the street number signs in so much of Portland at night? Oh, like, oh it's, not, it's not just you. Is um, it the reflectivity in our, in, our, in our household, the lack of reflectivity on uh, on the street, on um, like cross signs, 
is the most enraging thing in our household. We talk about it. You're talking about like this is 25th Avenue, yep. and yeah, yep. like can't, you can't, can't, you can't, you can't find can't that. find it. You're driving in a neighborhood in the city at night, and you're hoping. And then you're and you, when you're looking for that, yeah. you're not looking for people. It's, it's, I can't, it's sure. Sketchy. Um, um, I don't know uh, to tell you the truth. I can take a look to see if um, if we are manufacturing those in a different way, or frankly, if they're covered in dirt or dust right. uh, in a way which they haven't been before. Or they wear out. I don't know. Uh, or film the film on that on this. They're fine in the daytime, by the way. Yeah, they, yeah, just totally. don't, they don't reflect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I I totally hear you. I, I'm so old and my eyes are so bad. I think I probably don't even aspire to, to be able to read the street signs at night. You know, I I do have to roll slow and uh, just make sure that there's not a bicyclist or some guy pushing a cart yeah, in front yeah. of my car. So, yeah, interesting. I don't know. It's just weird. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. Right. So an underlying theme, I think, of this election cycle, almost certainly the November election yeah. cycle, is that uh, within City Hall there are haves and have-nots tax-wise. That you're coming here and telling us that uh, while the Portland Clean Energy Fund is flush with cash, has more cash than they really know what to do with to the point where Carmen Rubio is playing Santa Claus and doing giveaways and her belt lines up with the, with the tin cup out. Does that not speak, however, to the problem with doing policy via tax measures? Isn't this a problem with direct democracy, basically? That when we create our, our taxing structure via a series of measures based on what we think will be popular with the voters that we end up actually not budgeting at all? Well, I can assure you we do budgeting. Uh, you know, my bureaus literally spend about 15 months a year uh, putting together our budget. So that, that critique is not quite fair. Uh, on the other hand, it is uh, true at the Portland metro area, I think, faces a color of money problem. So we have uh, um, not nearly enough resources to fund uh, basic infrastructure, like especially roads and whatnot. On the other hand, uh, there are some other spaces where dollars uh, are not getting out the door. Um, and um, I think one of the very challenging things uh, for me as I talk to voters about um, about something like this, when I go to talk to them of, uh, about the need to um, you know, renew this basic program that we've had for four years as they go, well, well, the county has all this money, why can't you just, mm -hmm. yeah, and it's, well, mm -hmm. you know, that's, the county has those dollars, but that's, um, but the county, um, you know, is not in, in the business that I'm in. I'm kind of a, I'm a pavement and pipe guy. Um, so there, it is a challenge to to do this. On the other hand, when you know, one of the things that I think is is good about this is um, I like the accountability. Unlike uh, some of the other recent tax measures that you have gone to the voters that exist forever, um, there is an accountability mechanism that says you know uh, the people who care about transportation have to go back to the voters every four years and uh, and make your case again. Um, and I think that is actually kind of healthy for democracy. I would argue that. Uh, some of the frustration that we have some of the, about some of the programs you've talked about uh, might be mediated if folks uh, uh, had the option to um, revisit their choices uh, every four years. Good answer. Thank you. I, I, I'm thinking a lot about this right now because yeah. Sophie's working on a story about the Kirby Garage, oh, yeah. a spot in Portland that has been, uh, the can has been kicked down the road for 50 years. Uh, and in many ways, what Sophie's reporting shows is that the can has been kicked down the road for 50 years because it's not something the public interacts with on a daily yep. basis. They're servicing the fleet of vehicles, 2,400 vehicles yeah. that the public does interact with on a daily basis. So because there's that degree of separation, most Portlanders don't think about it, and so therefore most Portlanders don't have to pay for it, and so therefore it gets pushed to the back of the line. Yep. And I just I just wonder if that's what, what, what you make of the fact that like certain things in this city that are politically popular, get funding, and certain things that are very important are left to rot. Um, I would say that that is one of the weaknesses that is baked into democracy. I'd also say that uh, one of the challenges of being a public leader is to go out to voters and explain you know, the strengths and weaknesses to our system. One of the strengths is accountability. Uh, one of the weaknesses is, frankly, if you don't have a champion to make your case, uh, you know, as is the case with Kirby Garage, um, it's going to be neglected. I will tell you, as a, a, 
a member of city council and a guy who um, cares deeply about um, infrastructure that people don't think about very often. Kirby Garage is very important and we need to address this. Certainly, uh, you know, this isn't about what my uh, professional future looks like, but should I uh, um, remain in City Hall for the years to come, certainly one of the things I'm looking at is uh, both rationalizing our approaches to um, funding but basic services and, um, and also, while at the same time, um, holding uh, government accountable for using tax do dollars wisely. Because the thing I just hear every day, and I think we all see it, is that Portlanders, um, many Portlanders can't afford to be here. Um, and I think none of us want a Portland where uh, part of your journey here is your kids will not be afford to grow up and grow old in this town. Um, that's not what I want to do. I don't think that's what any Portlander wants to do. Um, I do think that we need to be much better at funding our basic infrastructure uh, and requires discipline. You know, there's, uh, it's very difficult to jump into the infrastructure space and um, try to fix it overnight. You've got to basically consistently invest in maintaining your infrastructure year after year over decades, you know, in the infrastructure space where we say we're in the hundred year business. Can you um, just count back for one second, yeah. just define something for me. What's a color, what do you mean by color of money problem? Um, so I have dollars for, so for example, PCEF has dollars that could be used. No, okay. to, yeah, yeah. So, but I can't kind of necessarily, yeah. So yeah. dollars can get, yeah. get okay, spent got for it. different. It's, they've different. got different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So essentially this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are the colors. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Well, Thank you. Yeah. I just to yeah, yeah. Um, and for the most part, for example, um, PBOT uh, does not go to the general fund. Um, yeah. you know, um, so you, your property tax dollars are not the dollars that are being used to um, to fix our roads. Yeah. Um, uh, instead, we, for the most part, we're talking grants, we're talking fixing our streets, uh, and we're talking parking, you know, plugging the parking meters. And you know, a lot of, the, we haven't talked about this today, one of the other challenges that we face over at PBOT is, uh, and I think this is in many ways a good thing, uh, it's a lot more working from home, flex time, so my parking meters are not getting plugged, and uh, we got a guy over here driving a Tesla, so he's not paying uh, <laughs> gas taxes. Uh, you know, it really, uh, we are at the end of a particular era mm -hmm. in the, um, and how we go about um, funding transportation. Is people enforcing traffic ticket? Because during, I mean, for a Parking. long time they just didn't, they just didn't, right? Oh yeah, and frankly this is one of the, um, during uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, council um, and the commissioners in charge of PBOT basically got out of the business of uh, traffic enforcement. And I'll tell you, uh, to be fair, and this continued uh, for a while under my, my leadership too, you know, why was that? Partly because the, the folks who are out there um, issuing parking meter uh, parking tickets were also the folks that essentially repurposed to managing our RV challenges that, that were in And then space. when did you guys start ticketing again? Uh, we started, I mean, we, I don't think, we never stopped ticketing, uh, but one of, frankly, one of the ways I'm filling that uh, 30 million, $32 million hole in uh, PBOT's budget is to say, all right, uh, uh, parking enforcement folks, we gotta issue tickets again. And it's not just because of revenue, like we're here in uh, beautiful Northwest, uh, um, lots of little businesses, lovely restaurants and whatnot. Um, if there's not churn in uh, the park, in the parking spots <coughs> that are here, you know, these businesses die. This is something which I hear. So uh, all I know is I live on 24th and Overton. Okay. I park every single day on a street and I don't pay for it. And I've never once been ticketed. And her license plate number is. 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 Um, <laughs> supposed to be yeah. Um, that is. I, uh, I, just I should you I should inform you that that is likely to change. I will tell you. I live. <laughs> I live, uh, I live in inner southeast in the Buckman neighborhood, um, and I essentially gave a directive within the last couple of months saying, hey, hey guys, we gotta go out and issue more parking tickets. Um, and I will tell you, some of my neighbors and best friends who maybe let their registration expire or haven't been uh, plugging the meters uh, have gotten parking tickets and are very angry with me. Well, it just seems like if you're trying to plug this 35 million hole, you know, like an easy way is to get 
is people. me too. Yeah, my office is centrally I mean, side. They heard about month, parking kitties. No yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it's, I don't know. I mean, anecdotally, I'm seeing a lot more tickets in my neighborhood, yep, and yes. also based on how commenters are responding to our story about parking tickets recently, I would say that among the scumbag contingent, they've noticed. Yeah, yeah. no, it's um, it's it's uh, very real. I literally see them out there. Um, I asked them to do it. I've seen them out there. You know, we're trying to be mindful in terms of how we're doing it. So we're trying not to just slam, uh, you know, this will expand to this whole city, but we're trying not to hit, you know, predominantly minority neighborhoods. We're trying to do it in a fairly even space. I'm also trying to educate people that, hey, this is coming. Uh, and not only is this coming, this is here now. Uh, so uh, you really, this is, if, if this, you're not going to save yourself money by not plugging your meters. I recognize that was true during the pandemic. Uh, but uh, we are posting pandemic and this is uh, part of the realities of being post pandemic as we all have to be good citizens and neighbors that that means registering your car that means plug in your meter that means not drinking and driving and that means not running red lines okay oh Ryan I'm sorry Ryan I have been rattling off anything I missed or anything you want to add here we should ask though all right. No, I think you've done a phenomenal job of covering kind of the overarching issues that we have um, with the infrastructure difficulties. Um, you know, one of our concerns, not only for the local, but for the city, is that if we don't find these funds, all the problems that we're experiencing are going to be exacerbated. and. Portland cannot afford for its infrastructure to get worse. It will get worse for pedestrians, it will get worse for those that are riding bikes, and it will get worse for people that drive. Um, whether you drive in, I drive an old uh, Ford Escort wagon, a 1997, uh, All right. almost 375,000 miles. Oh my gosh. Um, and then we have a 2011 Toyota uh, Prius, so hybrid, so we're pretty conscious about how often we drive, and I think Commissioner Maps really spoke to the issues that there are potholes everywhere. Uh, if we have less workers in PBOT, there are going to be less prob people to fix the problems. You want to hear our fun question? Yeah. Okay, so this yeah. isn't really, this isn't really yeah. pertaining here, but if you want to ask, answer it, you can. Yeah. We've been asking candidates. If somebody was going to play you in the movie about your life, the biopic about your life, who would play you? So, who would play this this uh, measure? Who would play? All right, this is why I have oh uh, <laughs> political consultants like you. Uh, I mean, I, th I think we should go back to who would play you. That'd be more fun. <laughs> who would play the measure? Um, you don't have to answer this, but it's interesting to think about. Who's your most? Basic actor that just shows up. Yeah, just shows up, hard working. Just does the you know the basic stuff we need to get done. Tom Hanks. Well, I was gonna say Tom Hanks. Yeah, there you go. It's Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks. There you go. He doesn't like it. Yeah, absolutely. He pulls well. And the, you know, and this is one of the things like people love or care about our streets, care about this basic services. Something um, that you should you should at least be aware of. Um, so if uh, we don't get this, if this the voters and their wisdom choose not to renew this, and I know times are tough, I, I don't assume this is a slam dunk. Um, I got, uh, this, that'll happen late May, got to pass a budget in uh, June, uh, or by the end of June, uh, means $70 million in paving that won't get done, and a safety project that won't get done, and stuff that won't get um, fixed. It also, um, so People I'm gonna, gonna die. Hmm? People are gonna die, right? People are gonna die, and you know, so there. I can translate also in just budget cuts for real people. How do I balance budgets? And so that's, if this doesn't get renewed, it puts me in a position of, uh, if I just translate this into humans, that's about 45 people I need to let go um, at Peabot, um, which I'll tell you, um, as we were putting together, I started out with a $35 million hole, but got it whittled down to about a $4 million hole. Um, um, I um, try to hold on to my people because um, I can't, we do not yet have robots that can go out and do the work that, that we need to do. Um, uh, so it's, this is a serious thing. 
for for us in this transportation space it, it is pretty existential and I think it's not just existential for us for, for the folks who do this work I think it's an existential um, challenge for the folks who live in the city mm -hmm. too. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh sure that was fun.